Welcome to the British Artists Blacksmith Association. So what we're hoping to do over the next few weeks, months, and hopefully years, is do a series of introductory talks um, with other professional blacksmiths coming together and sharing you know, your experiences, what you've been up to, your career, your workshop, your setup, and all of that useful information. Um, and put those together and send those out every Friday night uh, here on uh, Zoom to start with, and then eventually moving its way to the YouTube channel for the British Artists Blacksmith Association. So um, some numpty came up with this concept, and so unfortunately drew the short straw to, uh, to go first. Um, so as a bit of an introductory, my name is William Holland. Uh, I'm a professional blacksmith based out of Phoenix Forge here in Southwest Wales, um, in Carmarthen, if you're trying to find us on a map. Um, and yeah, uh, let's do this. So my journey into blacksmithing is very similar to probably a lot of yours. Uh, I had a keen interest in school in making things in practical applications, uh, and I wanted to explore that. Uh, initially, I didn't know I wanted to go and be a blacksmith, so I tried a few different things. I went off and joined the army and did some practical courses in the Rimi um, and did some different bits and pieces uh, before leaving, coming out, and then feeling a bit lost when I came out of the army. Wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. So ended up in a commercial butcher's, but that's a whole other story. Eventually, I came across uh, someone offering weekend classes, very much like I do today. Went along to one of those. Absolutely loved it. Absolutely fell in love with blacksmithing, the whole process, forging hot metal, the design, you know, making bits and pieces and that whole three-dimensional world that, you know, it's part of. Um, absolutely love it. So um, eventually I applied to go to Hereford. Mm. Uh, so it was absolutely brilliant going to Hereford, learning all those different skills and being taught by some of the great blacksmiths out there, such as Adrian Legg, Henry Pomfret, uh, Steve Mitchell, Chris Blythman. Uh, Pete, Dave, and you know all the other lecturers that made that place such a wonderful um, environment to learn in, and you know shared with me some of the, so much of their knowledge and so much of their skills uh, that enabled me to go out into the workplace and actually work commercially as a blacksmith. Um, incredibly fortunate to be you know gifted those skills um, from such a wealth of knowledge that is the National School of Blacksmithing and uh, we all need to support that one and keep it going for many generations to come. So, um, yeah, that was my time at Hereford, you know, went off, uh, worked for a few different people. I was really lucky while I was a student, actually, um, to match the land a job uh, for Alex Wilkins Blacksmiths uh, between Hereford and Worcester. Uh, great bunch of guys, Alex and Floyd, um, and obviously met a few other people up there as well, Aaron, um, what was the name of that farrier? Can't remember the name of the farrier, but he was a laugh. He used to always drink a can of lager at lunchtime um, and then drive home. But that was a different story, different time. Um, but yeah, you know, absolutely brilliant. I was really fortunate working for Alex. He had a very production orientated business, uh, producing um, bespoke hardware for sort of restoration jobs and for timber framed houses. Um, and that taught me, you know, how to make things to a tight budget, how to forge things uh, quickly, accurately, and get them out the door. You know, the order's going out on Friday, that job's got to be done on Friday at lunchtime so they can get out the door Friday afternoon. Um, so that was really important, really good learning experience. Um, they obviously worked on a fixed range of product and, you know, it, it taught you that repetition, taught you to be good, taught you to be fast. And I needed that, you know, I needed that, that skill set and I needed that speed to actually be able to make a living as a blacksmith. Um, and that was really important for me. Um, eventually, went separate ways. I graduated from Hereford and then uh, moved, moved home, moved back to Wales for a bit. And then I ended up back in Hereford, uh, came back and worked for uh, Tramway Forge, um, who were at the time based in Hereford itself. Um, and that was you know, a completely different environment. They were very much commission based, working from um, design sent to them by architects. They had a fixed range of garden uh, ironwork that they took around places like the Chelsea Flower Show um, and the Morven Spring Shows and bits and pieces like those. Um, and that was a really good experience. Got to work on some uh, huge pieces of, of uh, ironwork um, and some really prestigious places as well. Things like big manor houses, um, private properties that belong to like oil barons and all, all sorts of weird and wonderful customers um, with a big group of guys. That was a, quite a big forge, that one. Uh, I think at the time there was about 15 people working there. Um, there was two or three actual blacksmiths and the rest were fabricators and welders and um, spray painting people, whatever they're called, sprayers. Um, 
and you know line drivers and forklift drivers and all the rest of it so that was a really dynamic interesting business to be a part of for a, for a while um, and I enjoyed it it was great it was um, you know an interesting experience I wasn't there for very long um, my wife now she got a job back in Wales uh, so I ended up leaving that business to uh, to move back to Wales with her um, and support her in her career um, but you know it was an interesting experience while I was there so after I moved back to West Wales, uh, I ended up working for Andy Rowe for a short time. Uh, he was an interesting chap, did some interesting projects um, and some lovely work. He's mostly uh, commission based on uh, big public sculptures and stuff. So it was an interesting experience working in the public realm, uh, working on projects for hotels and for um, you know, uh, local authorities and that sort of thing. And it was an interesting, yeah, interesting experience, interesting time in my career. Um, but it wasn't very reliable income for me. Um, you know, being project based, he'd, he'd be really busy and then really quiet. Um, and we ended up, you know, going our separate ways for, for other reasons um, before I ended up s s trying to set up on my own. Um, I was quite lucky. Uh, one of my friend, good friends from Hereford, uh, Sam Pask, uh, decided to, well, he phoned me up one day and went, Will, I want to come work with you. Um, I think, you know, we work well together. And we set up in partnership which at the time was a good idea. Um, <coughs> but in the long scheme of things, um, you know, we, we ended up going our separate ways. But for uh, seven years, Sam and myself worked together um, and we combined our skills, we combined our incomes and everything else uh, to, to really build, build upon um, our skill sets and, and why we wanted to design and create uh, to actually start a business together. Um, because as you professional Smiths know, and you know, students watching this, it is not easy setting up as a blacksmith in today's environment. You know, you've got all the big toys, big workshop, and all the bills that go with it. So uh, yeah, that's a whole nother story, but uh, not an easy, easy game to set up in. But uh, I was lucky working with Sam, um, him and myself, we've got very similar personalities, and um, you know, we're, we're good springboard for one another's design processes, um, could always bounce ideas off each other. And it's always really helpful having a, a big hench guy such as Sam. Uh, I didn't need a forklift in the early days. He, he just like bench press a blooming RSJ off the back of a lorry because uh, he's a nutter. But uh, no, he's a, a good lad to work with. And, um, you know, we, we worked well together, you know, in the early days before I had power hammers and all the rest of it. Then, uh, you know, it was great having someone who was happy to swing a sledgehammer for uh, 12 hours in a, in a straight line, you know. So uh, that was really helpful and really handy. And um, yeah, I say Sam and myself worked really well together for six years, uh, built the business up um, before he decided that he wanted to go off on a different, different path. And um, that's, that's where he's gone. He's gone off to do uh, something different. So uh, all fairness to him. He still comes in, mind you, we're still good friends. He still comes in, helps me out with a bit of site fitting. Um, was in yesterday, pinching gas bottles off me and doing other bits and pieces. But uh, you know, it's, um, it's good to try and stay friendly with with people and uh, stay in their good books as, as time goes on and stuff. So Phoenix Forge, uh, that's the name of my business, my forge. And um, it's been an interesting journey. You know, we didn't start off with a completely linear, this is what we're gonna do. This is how my business is gonna be. Um, my original business plan went out, got screwed in a ball of paper, used like the forge, uh, and that went out the window a long time ago. Um, when I first started in business, you know, I'd come from uh, working for people like Alex, doing production type forging, um, making small pieces and small objects. Um, and it's very difficult to get into the commission world, working for, you know, uh, public bodies and that, when you haven't got a huge portfolio behind you. So um, my original vision was to, you know, start out making things like interesting uh, hardware, um, for bespoke houses and stuff like that, as well as doing things like fire pokers and fire sets and, and those and trying to sell them through local shops, local galleries. Uh, but it was a really difficult market. Um, we really struggled to make enough sales to really justify uh, working on it full time. Um, and we soon discovered that, you know, if you're selling something for 30, 40, 50 quid, well, to take a decent wage, you need to find hundreds and hundreds of customers every single month. Um, and then when you factor in people like galleries and shops and all the rest of it, well, they want to take a percentage too, usually 40, 50, 100% on top of your asking price. Um, and that made it really difficult to make a decent margin, make a recent, decent living. Um, and as time went on, people started asking us for things like gates and railings. And we soon discovered that actually, if you're doing, you know, one job for 4,000 pounds, 
Well, that's an awful lot of fire pokers. Um, and you need a lot less customers over the course of a year in order to do that. Um, and, you know, I was quite fortunate uh, in the early days, uh, we managed to land quite a big commission um, quite early on. Uh, I think we'd only been in business for, for maybe two years and um, I, I put together a tender and we managed to win a, a big town centre project for Ebervale Town Centre, um, which was, you know, over a £100,000 project. Um, and for two young blacksmiths, I think at the time I was like 23 or something, 24, um, it was a massive commission. Um, and there was 30 meters of hand forged, well, I say hand forged, it was all under the power armor, um, forged railings, which were quite a contemporary design that I'd actually come up with several years earlier um, when I was a student at Hereford. Um, so it was really nice to be able to take that initial concept and, and develop that into something much bigger. Um, we'll cut to some images and show those over the top. Um, as part of that then was a, a big dragon sculpture, uh, which formed sort of the main uh, focal point of the town centre. So it's a, it's a local Welsh authority, Ebervale Town Council, they quite liked the concept um, of having something culturally focused. So they quite liked the idea of having a Welsh dragon, which was a little bit less um, conceptual, uh, because there is another piece, big piece of sculpture in the middle of the town centre, which is this huge clock, which is supposed to be based of a horse. Doesn't look nothing like a horse. None of the locals understood the concept or the principle of it. Um, and unless you're reading through the gumph, you, you don't understand it either. You know, it's not something you can look at and go, it's, it's based on a horse, Ebervale, Glenebu, um, in, in Welsh means horse, something or other. Um, I'm not very good at Welsh, I don't speak Welsh, but that's a different story. Um, anyway, so uh, the Ebervale project was absolutely brilliant. Big piece of wall art based that around the, the town's uh, mining history, its uh, history around steelwork and, and, you know, we were two young steelworkers starting out in business. So it was really good for that. Um, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, we managed to expand the business, took on my first apprentice, um, young Jim Bob, who was straight out of school, 16 at the time, wet behind the ears, but he was damn enthusiastic. The poor lad used to cycle um, eight miles from his mum and dad's farm into Lampeter, take a 45 minute bus trip from Lampeter into Carmarthen, and then walk from the bus station in Carmarthen, uh, the two miles it is to the workshop. So he was keen, although that only went on for six weeks because after that point, he'd be falling asleep on a Wednesday. So uh, it wasn't long before we had to move him in with my mum and dad on the farm uh, where the workshop is, just so he wasn't traveling for such silly hours. But uh, young Jim, he worked for us for a long time. Um, I think he ended up uh, staying here for about five years um, and sort of developed into a, you know, a good member of the team. Uh, these days he's off uh, welding fabricating uh, for one of the big manufacturers in the UK. So, uh, you know, if you're out there, Jim, keep going. Uh, you, you're an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, but yeah, Ebbel started all of that. It, it gave us that, that commission. Um, I haven't done a lot of tenders since. We've done a few small uh, minor tenders, um, but most of my work has been private commission based. Uh, and to be honest, that's the sort of work I enjoy. You haven't got all the strings attached when, with working on big tender projects. Um, it's much more um, domestically focused. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's much more in, an intimate process. You know, you're speaking directly to the client. You're not trying to deal with um, big committees of people who've all got very different ideas. Usually the husband and wife have got very different ideas, but there's usually, you know, a nice middle ground that you can sort of design your piece for. Um, and, you know, a project uh, that I did recently was uh, an oak leaf gate, which was a uh, great fun for one of the local farms. Um, probably in the next town actually. Um, and it was really good coming up with a theme that the customer um, liked and we've then been able to develop. So we, we came up with this concept of this oak themed uh, oak tree gate. And then we've um, built upon that, you know, it's become uh, balustrading up the flight of stairs. It's become, um, you know, a side gate. We've got other commissions that I've got to go back and do things like brackets for the house, um, dwarf railings in the same theme. Um, and it helps to really tie that, uh, that property, all the ironwork on that property will then be of that same theme. And it, it's nice to build that into my portfolio as well as obviously building that relationship with the client. Um, so that's been really great. Um, I've been really fortunate actually to, to work on such a diverse portfolio. It's one of the things I really love about blacksmithing is how diverse my day-to-day -day work is. Um, last week I was forging giant tongs for uh, Castry Kilns making bits and pieces for them, uh, which they sell off to the foundries. Um, and this week I'm working on a commission for a wine cellar door for an architect. Um, and it's, you know, 
no two weeks are ever the same in this business. You know, there's always something different happening, always something different to do, um, some new process to learn and, and develop. And you know, that's what I like about it. It's really interesting, exciting and engaging. Um, and you know, helps the team stay engaged and uh, stay focused as well. <clears throat> some of the other great projects that I've, I've been lucky enough to work on um, is a few restoration projects. Uh, I quite enjoy, you know, stripping apart an old piece of metalwork, um, disassembling it and, and trying to come up with, um, you know, new methods and techniques of, of putting it back together and getting it to fit back within its new environment quite often. Um, I was lucky when I worked at Tramway uh, that we were um, employed to re-establish the, the original ironwork on the, uh, the main cloister entrance. So that was a really nice project. Uh, working with you know those original features and, and reinstating something that's been taken out and been living in a basement for um, I think about 200 years that been in the blooming basement of that cathedral um, so that was really nice sort of project to work on um, I was quite lucky to get quite a few commissions for um, St Donant's Castle um, down in South Wales which is a private school the place is like Hogwarts absolutely brilliant um, it's one of those rare castles in the UK where it's still used it's still functioning as a you know as a living object, it's um, it's a castle where it's actually today used as an international school. Um, it's filled with classrooms, with teaching environments, with libraries and, and bits and pieces. But it's all, I don't know, it's like Hogwarts. That's the only way to describe it. The place is magical. I absolutely love uh, St. Donald's Castle. Well worth a visit on their, on their, their open day. Um, and obviously being a workman that, that goes along and, you know, gets to crawl through the basements and through the attic spaces to try and get to pieces like flagpole brackets and all the random commissions that you end up doing handrails up spiral staircases and I mean uh, what else have we done we did all the uh, bronze work for the beast garden so some bronze repousse that was really interesting um, we got given a whole load of um, well we got given their last remaining bronze standard that these little beasts these little hand carved um, stone critters um, I think they're one of only two gardens I think the other is a private palace somewhere in the UK um, that have the, this beast garden um, and you know these things are absolutely wonderful but each one holds a little bronze standard with a little like tulip flower on the top and a little bronze flag uh, and we were like oh bronze yeah we did copper repousse in college well bronze is a copper alloy it's really soft that'd be nice and easy job to do no that bronze was like blooming stainless steel to work with I definitely chose the wrong type of bronze to work with and bronze repousse will not happen in this workshop again. <laughs> not anytime soon anyway, because it was not easy. But um, it was good fun, it was a good project and you know, we enjoyed it and working in that sort of environment, putting something back that is, you know, has been missing. Um, for whatever reason, they've been stolen by people and nicked by the kids and damaged and all the rest of it. So it's really good um, and really uh, satisfying and fulfilling, putting something back into that sort of historic environment, that historic landscape that that has been missing for, you know, 100 years or more. Um, and St. Donuts is one of those cool places where it's always been used as a film set as well. I think they filmed Da Vinci's Demons down there uh, and a few other bits and pieces. So it's quite cool having your work popping up on the telly from time to time. Um, so that was nice. I enjoy working down there. Um, obviously, there's lots of sort of historic sites in, throughout Wales. Um, and I've been fortunate and lucky enough to work on quite a few of the different ones. Um, we've done projects for CADU and for the National Trust and such. Um, but most of my work is, is private commission based. Um, so I think about four years ago, I got commissioned by a lady who actually owns the local tractor shop. Um, she lives in a very nice uh, Norman period house um, down in St. Florence. And um, she's got this lovely house with sort of a fortified walled garden with uh, castellations along the top. Uh, and it's got a lovely sort of stone archway, um, double sort of entrance that leads into the walled garden up to the house. Uh, and she commissioned us to make a, um, a nice sort of traditionally hand forged gate, uh, traditional fire welded scroll work, uh, repousse panels on there with a coat of arms for the house. Um, the original, not her coat of arms, because she's only been in there for 30 years or something. Um, but no, it was really interesting trying to come up with a design that would fit with the, you know, historic um, aspects of the house, incorporate that original coat of arms um, and look like it's been there forever. Um, that was a, quite a challenge uh, to come up with something that um, felt like it, you know, it fitted. It was part of the environment. Um, I think that gate took me two and a half months to do. Um, the Rapusi alone took me several weeks. 
Um, and it was, you know, it was just a brilliant, fun project. Apart from, for whatever reason it is, I always end up with fire welding to do in the middle of the summer when we're having a heat wave. I don't know why it works that way, but I can guarantee it, if it's gonna be a hot spell outside and I'm gonna be melting in a workshop, we'll get fire welding to do. And if it's minus 10 outside, I'll end up sat on the milling machine with a heater trying to defrost the blooming coolant for the milling machine. Just the way it goes, I guess, folks. But um, no, it was an interesting project, absolutely loved it. Um, she really appreciated it, um, and she's since commissioned me to make a side gate to lead from one wall garden to the next, uh, which was quite a nice little side gate. Um, again, firewall with scroll work, um, and I'm trying a few different techniques and some different bits and pieces that I'd not tried before. Um, and, you know, really enjoyed that little project. It was a nice little gate to work on. Um, where else have we done projects? Uh, we did one a couple years ago at Gethlei Manor, which used to be uh, the local agricultural college. Um, that was an interesting one because um, they had a big set of gates on the side entrance to what would have been the stables and the, the current owner uh, who'd not been in there for very long um, wanted to continue the theme of that original ironwork and reinstate some gates that had been lost and removed by the college and removed by people in the past um, and put back some of those original features. Um, so I made two sets of, of gates to match the original um, you know, using those traditional techniques, made these blooming massive mace head um, finials to go on these gates out of, uh, I think they were 200 mil spheres um, with forged points out of like 50 mil square bar or something stupid on the sides of them. These things look absolutely lethal and uh, they were an interesting challenge. They didn't end up getting fabric forged, but um, that was down to client budget more than anything else. But um, that was another interesting project and really enjoyed working on it. Um, didn't enjoy working for the client. He actually nearly made me go bust on that job. Um, so that's a warning for you. If your client takes a long time to pay his deposit, he's gonna take a long time to pay his bill. Um, unfortunately, that was why I ended up losing my apprentice, Jim, uh, because uh, the customer on that particular job ended up taking three months to pay his final bill. Um, and bearing in mind that I'd been working on that job for three months, it's fair to say I run out of money. Um, and yeah, very nearly folded end up nearly going bust on that project so that wasn't a good situation to be in um, we learned from that and he asked me the following year to go back and quote for some other gates um, and he got told that yeah i'd be happy to do more work for him but he would have to pay 100 percent of the bill up front and it's fair to say i've not done any work for him since and i don't regret it um, we will not work for that one again unless he pays for it up front now I've worked on loads of private commissions over the years. Um, I don't know how many gates I've made. I've, I've lost count to be honest. Um, endless meters and meters of railings um, and done a whole myriad of different designs, some traditional, some a bit more contemporary um, and tried to mix it up. I wouldn't say I've got a um, dedicated style that you, know, you would recognize and go, that's definitely one of Will's uh, jobs. Um, there are probably a few people out there you probably recognize my dragons. But I quite like the fact that my work is quite mixed. It's really varied. Um, and I'm a commission-led blacksmith um, and metal worker. Um, I don't tend to work speculatively. I would like to do more speculative work, uh, but it's a very difficult one to justify uh, making sculptures and making you know, iron work uh, and having it sitting in galleries and things. And kind of got burnt in the early days doing that for shops and galleries. Um, and then that sort of steered me away from that sort of business model. <clears throat> These days, typically 99% of my work is commission-based. Um, now, one way that I used to sell my work and, and do a lot of advertising for the business, which might help some of you newer guys who are getting into it, is uh, through doing things like um, public events, doing uh, national shows, doing the competitions, of course, that always helps and participating in those. Um, but yeah, something I started doing really early on was doing things like the Morven Spring Show, um, the Autumn Shows, the RHS Shows, um, because they're a really good way to meet members of the public and get your work in front of people. You don't always get your work in front of the right people and it's quite easy to get carried away having spoken to 200 people uh, and had 200 people go, yeah, I'm right, really interested in this project. And you're going, well, I'm gonna be a bloody millionaire on Monday when that phone starts ringing. Because Monday, the phone doesn't ring very well. Um, but one of my centerpieces I made for those shows was um, started off making smaller dragons. We did the big one for Ebba Vale and I'd done one previous to Ebba Vale for a private customer as well, although that wasn't very well paid. But um, we, I ended up making a few different sculptures um, based around this dragon theme. I'd, I'd enjoyed the process and quite liked to experiment and explore that a little bit more um, and ended up making 
uh, two or three smaller ones uh, that I took along to the shows with me. Uh, through one of those, I ended up actually getting a really good job. Uh, actually started a really good sort of almost friendship with one of my clients, uh, one of my patrons, who um, eventually I ended up making driveway gates for, uh, initially for the back entrance to his house, and then for the posh entrance to the, to the house, um, all the way up in Bishop's Castle. Uh, he was a really good customer. He's been a really good customer to me um, over the years um, and has commissioned me to do an awful lot of work on his, on his residence. That was a good project. That was in the days when Sam was still working with me. Uh, those gates, you know, traditionally made, all punched and riveted, a uh, bit of repousse on there, which was nice. Um, and later on, we went back and we added to it and made more and more pieces. But it was the, those little dragon sculptures that I'd made that sort of gave me that foot in the door. Um, and I've done quite a few since. We, we put one in the Botanic Gardens locally. Um, it's one of the local sort of features in the, in the landscape of the Botanic Gardens. And I've made one of these dragon sculptures, um, big smoky, sleeps on a big rock, big piece of pennant, uh, which was quite nice. Uh, ties it into that sort of Welsh theme, nice piece of local Welsh stone. And um, since then, um, I've been commissioned to uh, make more dragon sculptures. Some of them have gone international, did a big one last year, which I sent over to a guy over in Sweden. Uh, that was a, a great project, kept me busy for uh, probably nearly two months um, during the whole COVID meltdown. So uh, I was quite fortunate to have that commission to uh, sort of fall back on with everything else melting around us in the world. Um, so that was, that was quite good. Um, and, you know, kept the bills paid, which is the important thing. Um, but kept me interested, kept me going. Um, they're a bit fabricated. There's not a huge amount of forge work in, in those dragon sculptures that I've done. Um, but, you know, not everything's about forging. Sometimes it's, you know, about exploring other passions um, and doing some other creative work that enable you to go in different directions. Um, and staying motivated in the forge is something that, you know, I think we all struggle with uh, a little bit, coming up with new concepts and, and designs and bits and pieces. Um, and that pushed me in a different direction as well. Um, so, um, a few years ago, I was really flagging in the workshop. Sam had gone off to do his own thing. Um, I decided to, to call it quits. The business was in a bit of a, a dicey situation. Cash flow wasn't great. We weren't earning huge amounts of money um, and, and things got, had got a bit difficult and a bit tricky. Um, and you know, that happens to every business. Now, at the time I was like, ah, you know, do I, do I wanna persist with this? Do I keep going? I'd sort of fallen out of love with it a little bit. Um, you know, was sort of begrudging the forging because I was almost doing it for free. Um, just to sort of, you know, keep my skills in and I wasn't charging enough for my work. I mean, that was the fundamental one, not charging enough, um, which is really difficult to do, um, especially, you know, in those early days, it's not, not easy to do at all. So I ended up um, sort of stepping back, I guess, from, from the edge of trying to do things commercially. Um, and I ended up going to university and sort of studying um, architecture and spent three years up in Swansea um, at the new uh, school of architecture up there, uh, learning, you know, how to, not how to be an architect because that takes seven years, but learning the basics of architecture and doing a degree in, in that, um, which was an interesting avenue to explore and a totally different way of looking at the built environment um, and how work is, is um, interacted with, why, why you're coming up with concepts um, and doing things, not purely for their um, actual function, but for the, the greater impact on that, the built environment, um, and you know, how that you know, concept can be used to sort of funnel people, move people to do different things, and, and transform the environment and the way that people uh, feel about your work and interact with it. So it was really interesting to, to do that. Um, while I was exploring architecture and going down a, a slightly different path, I was still in the forge, I was still making things, um, still doing a little bit of work uh, commercially in the background as well keeping my hand in. Um, so um, the more time I spent in the office, the more I realized that what, what I was actually passionate about was design, um, constructing things. And I didn't want to go down a career path such as architecture, where yes, you come up with the initial concept. Yes, you're dealing with the clients and their briefs um, and you're, you're exploring that dynamic, um, which is you know very much the same as it is in, in blacksmithing. Um, but what that side of things lacked was the, the ability to take a design, um, develop it physically, and then have that satisfaction of actually being involved in the whole manufacturing process um, and exploring the tooling and, and 
all of that creative side of things that are done in three dimensions that we do every day in the forge. Um, and it reinvigorated that passion for, for blacksmithing um, and got me more motivated to get back in the forge and to you know, explore more forms and to do things more creatively um, and experiment and, and play in the forge. Um, and eventually that led me to the, the playing in the forge and trying to keep motivated. It led me to doing stuff for YouTube. Um, and some of you may know, I've got a channel, Phoenix Forge, up on YouTube, and I think we've done over 200 videos now. We've done quite a few. Um, and I started out going, right, I'm just doing it to, to keep myself motivated. So I'm just gonna have fun with it. Stuff the views and trying to, you know, get YouTube famous and all that stuff. We're just gonna do things that I enjoy, and they're a bit of an experiment. <clears throat> now, so we've all made bottle openers, and so I thought, right, every single week, I'm gonna come up with a new bottle opener. It's a little bit of a play on a single object, and it's grown into something that I, I'm, I'm quite proud of. Uh, it's quite cool, come this way. So as you can see, I've made a few bottle openers. Um, I think we're up to 40 now. Um, done a different one every single week. Um, and it's been a bit of a laugh. It's been something fun and exciting to experiment with, try out some different techniques for making things like pea pods, um, some different fire welded twists experimenting with a bit of copper and twisting it around steel. And if I've been working on a bigger project, so like I was working on the oak tree gate um, for the client, um, doing some balustrading for him. So I've incorporated that into that week's bottle opener. Um, and then it all finds its way out to Blumen YouTube. So it's one of those little things, um, experimenting in the forge and finding an excuse to do it. You know, it's something I struggled with in the early years was, you know, you're busy, I've got orders that I've got to get out the door. Um, and um, that sucks away from that motivation, that sort of passion, it sort of eats at it. And again, I've got to do this because I've got to make money, you know, and it, it's really difficult. Um, but having something like this that is purely a little bit of fun, um, it's purely something to experiment with and, you know, play with, gives me that excuse to, you know, try something different to, you know, just for fun. Um, and that also moved itself into, um, you know, making daft things for YouTube. I've done blooming crossbows. Uh, we've been experimenting with pirate weapons recently, made a cutlass and some other stupid things, a couple of different spears. And um, we had an experiment last year playing with fire arrows and different designs for those. And what could they do? And setting pallets on fire in the middle of a field. Um, so that experimentation and that development is something that um, I think is really important to all of us. And we all find different ways of doing that within our work. Cutlass, beer. Ha, we have a sword and beer. Right, don't need much more in the workshop. So um, what was I saying? Staying motivated in the workshop. Now, um, as we all know, working on big commissions gets a bit tedious, gets a bit boring. God, I do love a cutlass. Right, anyway, put it down. Stop playing with sharp pointy objects. Um, not a bladesmith, we're blacksmiths. Different. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, staying motivated. Now, um, the downside of working on big commissions, you know, many of them take three, four months to do. Um, some of them like Ebervale took me six months and it can be a bit of a slog. Um, the first week is always brilliant. You've got a new concept, you've got a new sketch, you draw it out on a great big sheet of plywood or on a steel bench and you're trying to figure out how the bloody hell you're gonna make it. Uh, and then you get to making it. And it's always fun and exciting, experimenting with different processes, coming up with different ideas and different jigs and tooling. I love making jigs and tooling. It's brilliant, it's the best part of the job. Um, but when you've got 100 of object A and 100 of object B to make, it gets a bit tedious. So part of the reason for obviously doing YouTube and experimenting with that sort of stuff um, was it breaks up the monotony of making, you know, endless hundreds of component parts for, for that job that I've been working on for three months because it's only the start and the end of the job when you can stand back and go, that's a nice gate, pretty happy with that one. Um, where you actually really, actually enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Um, we all love blacksmithing, but yeah, making batch production of stuff, uh, it's not for me anyway. I'm not a batch producer. It doesn't really excite and engage me. Um, but that did lead me to do, um, to become passionate about teaching. Um, it was something that I'd offered a little bit of in the past. You know, we'd have one or two people come through the door because, um, you know, they wanted to come and have a go at doing a bit of forging. Um, and as time went on, it became a bigger thing. Um, and then about three or four years ago, I went, right, sod it. I'm going to tool up for it. We're going to run 
four different classes or four different types um, and we're gonna do it every weekend. And if we're fully booked, brilliant. If not, then we're not really making any money. But we're really lucky in the fact that we have been really busy and it's a growing part of the business until COVID happened. And then we lost 50% of the business through COVID um, and did more stuff for YouTube to sort of fill that gap, um, but not financially because YouTube does not make us any money. Don't get misconstrued on YouTube. You will not make a living out of it unless you're really lucky. Um, so um, yeah, I've been lucky. We, we tooled up for teaching and we started doing that more often um, and it became a bigger and bigger part of uh, the workshop and Phoenix Forge and bigger part of my portfolio. Um, and it's something I'm passionate about and really enjoy doing. I really enjoy having a different mix of people coming into the workshop every week um, with their stories and you know, grandpa was a blacksmith. We've all heard that one a thousand times before. Um, and forged in fire, you can love it or loathe it, but it's good for business guys. Uh, the more promotion that we can get for the, for, for the blacksmithing as a whole uh, subject area, the better. The more people you're going to get through your doors who want to give you hard-earned cash so that they can make it and you can stand there and go, yeah, he's doing a sh job of that. But they're happy. They're loving it. They're really enjoying themselves. Um, and you're enjoying, you know, having them, the people, having that company, having that mix of dynamic people coming through the doors. Um, and it really helps to keep you inspired. When you get to the end of the day, they're looking like they've been down a coal mine rather than you look like you've been down a coal mine. And they're going, I really thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, thank you for, you know, showing me a little bit about your, your trade and your craft and things. It's absolutely brilliant. It's really motivating for me. I really enjoy doing it. It's great. Um, and for those of you not doing it or thinking about offering classes, do it. You know, I'm not bothered about having local competition, someone else that they can go off and um, get taught. You know, don't be afraid of that. You know, if, if Joe Bloggs is down the road running the Smithy and he's got 10 classes on the go, don't worry about offering them yourself. You know, it's really good. As long as your insurance is in place um, and you've got all the kit health and safety wise to be able to have liabilities in the workshop, then you'll be absolutely fine. So, um, Obviously, having people in the workshop and having to need six of everything means I needed six blooming linishers or belt grinders, if you insist on calling them belt grinders. Um, and so what better time than give you a bit of a tour of the workshop and show you behind the scenes of what we've got and where it came from and uh, show you around a little bit. Now, sort of two halves to my business. There's the, the smithy um, and then there's the fabrication side of the shop as well. So I'll split this into two halves and I'll show you around the forge first because uh, that's what you're probably more interested in. The joys of having people in the workshop is you have to protect your stuff like you would not believe. Um, the number of people that have come over here and started swinging hammers near my anvil is um, scary, um, but they don't do it twice because they don't live to tell the tale. Anyway, um, so this is my little hole um, in the workshop. I ended up pushed over to a corner because one of the downsides of having people in the workshop um, every weekend is that they all want to use your stuff or your hammers go for a wander around the workshop or your tongs go for a wander, your punches wander off somewhere and you can't find a damn thing. So I ended up using forge number six purely for a reason that no, it's not that often that we have six people in at once. Um, usually you have four or five um, and that's absolutely fine. Therefore this forge gets left alone. Um, and then as because I was using this fire and using this forge, um, everything else started migrating over into this corner. So um, I ended up with two power hammers following me over here. I ended up with a hydraulic press um, and the gas forge ended up creeping over here as well um, and a few other bits of kit. So I'm not trying to run around doing all sorts of different bits and pieces, um, running around the forge like a lunatic any more than I do already. Um, so over here, I've got my um, C4140. Uh, picked this one up back in October, November, something like that, um, from a young startup blacksmith who unfortunately didn't start up in blacksmith and he'd imported it um, and sold it pretty much, I think, for what he paid for it. Um, so I was pretty happy, um, but it's handy having two hammers next to each other. I can set tooling up on one, have the other tool in on the other, um, and I'm not chopping and changing between tools. It makes me more efficient. Um, hopefully in the long run, will make me more money and pay for the machine. But yeah, well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I've got hammers, what can you do? Who, who, who doesn't love power hammers? Um, this is my favorite little hammer that I got in the workshop. Well, I say that, I better be quiet because I'll upset the onion. Um, this is my uh, Tannard. Um, I think she's a 50 kilo. Um, the C4140 is a 40. Ooh, we set her off now. And um, yeah, the 40, she's supposed to be 40 kilo, but the difference in blow weight between these two hammers and the size of the die comparison, and there's no data tags on this. Um, this is a second hand anvil, uh, anvil. 
second-hand power hammer that I picked up from um, Vaughan's um, a few years ago. I think I've had this one now for six or seven years in the forge, um, and it's been an absolute godsend. Uh, before that, we had the old-fashioned tire hammers, because uh, it was all I could afford. Um, and we ended up building those, and we sold a few of those um, around the country to a few different smiths as well. Um, and that was a fun experiment. I quite like making power hammers. It was quite interesting. A uh, bit of machining, a bit of forging. Um, yeah, it was something fun to do. Um, but this is my workhorse. This is the one I go to every day um, when I'm forging, when I've got different bits and pieces on. Go on then, go down if you're gonna go down. No biting people. Um, over behind the camera, so over this way, um, I've got my little 30 ton hydraulic press. Um, from those of you that follow my vlog on YouTube, uh, you'll be aware that this one broke my arm back in November and so we're not getting on very well at the moment. Um, I've just about recovered-ish, probably be another six months before I have to stop seeing my physiotherapist. Um, men and white coats come lock you up, they love that, don't they? Um, where are we going? So, um, hydraulic press, loads of tooling for this thing, absolutely brilliant bit of kit for squidging hot metal. I did have a bigger one, we used to have a 50 ton uh, hydraulic press, uh, but unfortunately when Sam left the business, I had to buy him out. In order to buy them out, I had to sell off probably 30%, 40% of the equipment that we'd built up over the time, which was sad to see it go, um, but needs must. You need the cash, you need the cash, don't you? So uh, you sell off the toys and you end up buying slightly smaller ones uh, until the budget allows for you to buy a big one again. Um, I am in the market for a bigger press. If you've got one to sell, let me know because I am interested um, and I might swap a power hammer for one. So down the bottom here, um, I've got a range of our armor stakes, uh, different shaped tools of all different kinds. You can see they don't get used very often, um, but the handy things to have. Um, I acquired these off one of my buddies, um, Frank, that I trained with back up in Hereford. Uh, he was doing some armor making and some different bits and pieces, made himself a full suit of Japanese armor, which looked cool as anything. Um, and unfortunately due to shoulder injuries and other bits and pieces, he had to sort of move out of playing that game. Um, and so he sold them to me. Um, they don't get as much use as I would like, but they do get used occasionally. I did use one yesterday for doing some forming, so that was quite cool to actually get use of the damn things. Um, what else have we got over here? All sorts of random crap. I am quite a collector, I would say. Collector is probably not the right word for it, but I do acquire a hell of a lot of junk. Um, things like these old hand clamps. I've got a bit of a fetish for old tools. Um, I suppose we all must do being blacksmiths. Um, we, all, we all love them. Um, they tend to like acquire them and last year was bloody awful for it um, someone was selling up a smithy uh, and I made a bid won the bid um, and bought the entire contents of his workshop which was kind of cool because um, I ended up with six or seven pallets worth of tongs and top swages and bottom swages and boxes of hammerheads and all the other random crap that I'm still exploring I opened one up last week looking for drifts and found a whole crate full of drifts I didn't even realize existed um, and so instead of spending the day making axe head drifts, I didn't have to, because it was already a box for them. Win-win. So um, this is one of the things, one of the problems of running the class is obviously you need six of everything. So it's fair to say, I've got six pairs of tongs that hold every type of flat bar that I need for my classes, every type of round bar that I need for my classes, and probably everything else in all. Um, and hammers to boot, and punches, and drifts, and hot sets, and hot things, and what not, flatters and all the rest of it. Swages, fullers, the works. Um, I've acquired a lot of it over the years um, and it does. some of it gets used all the time, some of it just goes dusty. Um, but it's handy having it. Uh, you don't need it all if you're starting out, you know, if there's young students watching this um, in colleges at the moment, don't get perturbed by how much kit I've acquired over the last 15 years. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, not as long as some of you guys who've been doing it forever. Um, especially some of you really old ones who invented blacksmithing. Um, one day when I've been smithing for as long as you have, um, hopefully I'll have even more kit and more toys, um, even if my wife will murder me in the process. So um, yeah, more toys to come, but don't let it annoy you. Don't let it um, upset you as you're starting out. You don't need it all straight away. It's not something you need um, from day one. You only need the basics. You know, that kit you use every day in the workshop in Hereford or at Plumpton or in uh, Warwick, that's the kit that you're gonna be using. Um, I was lucky when I was a student at Hereford that as part of the technical course that I did, um, that we actually made the majority of the tongs, uh, hammers, punches. Um, we even made a forge in those days and anvil stands. And um, I had enough get up and go that while I was there, I went out and went to the scrapyard and got blooming chunks of RSJ and bits and pieces and made leg vice stands. 
uh, bought my first leg vise from the scrapyard in Hereford. Uh, so um, this is the main part of the forge. Um, I used to use, well, one of these forges I made in college um, and Sam made the other one. So what we actually did was butt two single forges up together. Um, Sam was working for a big fabricators up in Cardiff at the time, um, Alar Engineering, something like that. Um, and he made a new canopy which bolted together and made one forge out of two, which was absolutely brilliant. New front wash to obviously bring it all together. Um, and we made a few forges. I made all the others as well. Um, so it's quite cool that obviously being a smith, you can make all your own kit, um, which is handy, isn't it? Um, got a good selection of anvils in the workshop these days. Um, some of them, Sam had his first anvil from the old colliery behind his house. Him and his dad walked up to the top of the blooming mountain. Uh, to the huge hole that's in the top of um, Caffili Mountain, picked up the anvil, which weighs 250 kilos by chance, and he walked down the side of the mountain with it, and uh, it's over there. But um, that's a whole another blame ball game. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've acquired a few anvils over the years. Again, I have a collection like Adrian Legg's uh, collection of anvils. He's got more more anvils than uh, than uh, ducks have got feathers. But uh, that's a different game. Um, so, uh, obviously the advantage of making new forges and bits and pieces and having all these anvils is that I can use them for my classes. Um, you know, we get a good bunch of people in every, every weekend, hopefully post-COVID, things get back to normal. Um, and we can get the public back in here. You know, um, it, it's a great thing to, to acquire this kit, but it needs to be used. This isn't a museum. Most of the kit in here gets used most of the time. Some of it just sit around looking pretty, burning holes in my bank account. But... I'm not as bad as some of you at collecting kit and spending gross sums of money on toy hammers. I really want that toy hammer, by the way. That thing's amazing, but I can't have it. Um, so over in a corner, I got my big hammer, um, my 200 weight onion. Um, I was really lucky when I started out smithing, um, working for Alex Wilkins. He had that sat in the corner of his workshop. Um, it ripped the fixings out of the ground. And because of the nature of his business and what he produces, it wasn't really getting used. Um, and I worked for Alex for about three or four years on and off. Um, I worked for him while I was a student and a little bit after Hereford as well. Um, and he finally agreed to sell it to me. Um, and it followed me home on my last day working for Alex um, and came to work for me. Um, it doesn't get used every day. She's a bit of a grumpy old girl is my onion. Um, she does need a bit of TLC. Um, but for the most part, it works, it runs. Um, but again, I don't, I'm not working on huge commissions all of the time using big sections. Um, um, the little hammers that I've got, the 240s, um, they cope with the majority of the work that I'm doing, forging tapers, punching holes, uh, texturing bars, that sort of stuff. Um, but the onion got used quite a lot last year, actually. We had a big job for the Botanic Gardens, um, big commission down there making um, some railings um, up to the entrances of these bridges that were installed. Uh, so I had like, oh God knows how many hundreds of meters of 25 square that I needed to texture. Um, and the onion was definitely the tool for the job. Now, the nice thing about the onion is it's still running off its Frankenstein electrics because she's 1937, actually, she's a, a good year. Um, and she's still running off the original electric box from 1937. Now, when we installed that hammer, I phoned an electrician up and went, can you come wire it in, please? Because I don't know nothing about electric. Um, so the Sparky turned up and I bought a Star Delta box because Alex had told me that it was a Star Delta starter um, and it was just an old one and, you know, being young and smithing, not really knowing much about electrics. So I went, yeah, all right. So I bought a Star Delta box, this little white box, stuck it on the side of the wall, um, asked the bloke if he could wire it in. Comes in, gets all his tools out, all set up on the floor and then goes, I don't know what that is, but there's too many bloody wires sticking out the side of there. So I dragged in the old electrics and I'll show you the old electrics. Come this way. So inside here is Frankenstein's electrics. Power is off, I hope. Let's use a pencil. And it's full of old fashioned knife switches, little dials that spin round and when they get up to speed, they engage the next electrical switch, which closes the next circuit and starts the next wheel spinning. Now, the Sparky, he didn't want to touch this. He said, nah, that thing's never gonna run. And because I was told it was a Star Delta box, this thing actually lived outside in the rain for two years prior to me actually starting a power hammer. Because I couldn't, even though I bought the damn thing, I couldn't afford to actually do the installation on it. Um, so it sat on pallets outside. And um, I wasn't planning on using the original electrics. Now, Sparky, he wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. He said, no way am I touching that. No way am I signing it off. Um, so Samuel and myself, we cleaned it all down. Uh, we got the sandpaper out, sanded it off the contacts. And... Um, 
got a length of rubber hose and started poking things in the hope that something would come to life. And eventually, a great big blue flame, blue flame, blue spark, went across all the zinc coils in the back uh, and things started moving, things started happening and Frankenstein came back to life. Um, unfortunately, this old girl, I had to sell her. Um, so when Sam left, I did have to actually part ways with my 200 weight, which was a sad day, but I needed the cash to buy Sam out um, and to get back to zero. So um, we, we sold this to Aaron, who runs Oldfield Forge up in Hereford, um, Hereford-ish, um, and we had to wave goodbye to her. But eventually she came back um, after I finished uni and I had a bit more money in my pocket. Uh, he'd not used it, he hadn't done the installation himself and he decided to actually part with it. Um, and so we did eventually go out and buy this old girl and she's still running once she gets up to speed the beast that she is I ain't got me now tricks work if it ain't broke don't fix it because you'll end up breaking it but uh, now the old girl still works um, she's running absolutely beautifully uh, I was actually using this last week made some custom tooling up one thing modification I have made to my um, onion is to actually weld on like a, a little block so I've created like a hardy hole for my um, for my bottom die um, and that allows me to drop tooling on and off without having to hold on to it so that's the downside of having broken my wrist is that I'm really struggling to hold power armor tool into my left hand um, and operating at the pieces of steel with my right hand and actually being able to manipulate it stuff. So by putting a little hardy on there, or in fact on this one, I've actually put two little hardy holes on the side, um, means that I don't have to hold on to my stock uh, or my tools that I'm trying to use, um, spring swages and stuff like that and move away from it. Um, so I was forging some triangular section on there, uh, which I used as a detailing for a set of estate gates that I'm currently working on. Um, well, finished, they're getting installed. Um, right, I'm gonna climb out my old, hold on. <clears throat> Last year, trawling through Facebook Marketplace, I was in the market for a new bench, um, and there was a scrapyard down in Colchester, I think, um, who had this thing listed, uh, the old peg table, and I bought it, absolutely brilliant. Um, we managed to get it delivered on a pallet, which was interesting, because the thing weighs two tons. Uh, the guy didn't have a clue what it weighed. He told me it weighed about 800 kilos, and I'm bloody glad I didn't drive to Colchester in my van and go and try and pick it up because my forklift barely picks this thing up and moves it around a workshop. We end up welding wheels on one end so that we could try and pick it up with a, a pump truck and crowbar it through the workshop, um, which did work. It got it to where it's currently positioned, um, but I don't fancy moving it anytime soon, although it needs to go up because it's too bloody short and it hurts me back. Um, but peg table, absolutely brilliant bit of kit. Um, we use this all the time. Uh, jigs just drop onto it. Um, what are those things called? Anvil dogs, um, knock them down, they clamp stuff down. Um, and having big big bars that you can drop in like this um, mean that you, you know, if you're bending up some 40 square and trying to you know, form some sculpture up or you know, some handrails or something, um, it's really, really useful. Uh, it gets used all the time. I know it's a little bit rusty. Everything goes rusty in here. It's whales and it rains a lot. Um, really handy. I love my new bench. It's great. Um, well, I do like the old one. So behind me, I've got my um, six, number six um, fly press. This thing got, gets used all of the time. Um, it's probably the most used tool in the workshop, um, other than perhaps the bandsaw and a pillar drill. Um, and if you're starting out in blacksmithing, it, you know, I'm sure all you big boys have all got hundreds of these damn things, um, and I've got a few of them and all. But um, this one gets more use than anything else. You don't need a power armor from day one. You can do 90% of the operations on a fly press. Um, they don't get used as much in college as they really should because you can do everything from straightening, punching holes, splitting, forming, forging, riveting up. All sorts of stuff can be done in the fly press with a little bit of ingenuity. Um, one of the good things I had from working for Alex Wilkins and doing production-based work um, was he was really creative on coming up with new tools and ideas for fly press tooling. And I've stolen most of his ideas and used them on mine. Um, so thank you very much for that one. Um, but it's really bloody handy, gets used all the time. Um, I would not be without this. It's baby brother, uh, which is over there, um, is the bar press. And up until a couple of years ago, I didn't know what a bar press was. 
Um, so we'll go show you. Let's go show you a bar press. So um, this is me bar press. Um, brilliant bit of kit. Now, the big advantage of this and the difference between this is it hasn't got a foot in the way of you getting access to the actual machine. So making rings or whatever you're making and gate wraps, you can actually get the whole damn thing underneath the fly uh, by bar press, it's not fly press. Um, but you're a little bit limited. This one's a, quite a bit smaller. So I would have said this is probably only a, maybe a four, number four. I don't think it's got a number on that side, is it? Not a proper one anyway. Um, so it's not got as much power. The other downside is that I'm limited to, I think that 60 square bar that goes through for the actual bar itself. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of force to um, actually bend um, or for the, that bar to deflect. So uh, if I can get my hands on a bigger one of these, I definitely will. Um, I've been using it all week. I've been working on some vine leaf gates that I'll show you um, shortly. Um, and it's really handy for getting in there and doing those little bends and opening curves out and doing things that you just can't physically do in a fly press or a hydraulic press, um, unless you've got a horizontal hydraulic press. Um, but I haven't got space for one of those. Um, so it's really handy. Um, I found this a big, big um, useful addition to the workshop. Uh, the only problem I do have is, is trying to find space for it to live. So uh, at the moment it's not bolted down because it does tend to get shifted around the workshop, shift around the forge. Um, but really, really handy. I've made this as well so that um, all of my tooling for my big fly press fits this one. So it's got an adapter on it. Um, but also the bottom bar, um, I've designed that in such a way that I can reverse all the tooling. Uh, so I can actually take this um, bending jig and flip it upside down. Um, and so that I can bend in the other direction. Uh, and roll things like rings and stuff without using a ring roller. Um, so it's really handy, really love it. If you haven't got a bar press, um, get one because it's really, really handy bit of kit to have in a forge. Now, the, the last bit of kit I've got up at this end of the workshop is of course my gas furnace. Um, I've made a lot of these over the years. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have made your own too. Uh, I kind of object to Swan's prices, even though they're probably a little bit more refined. In fact, I know they are because I've used a lot of them. Um, but I quite like the adaptability that comes with making my own um, and playing with different uh, shapes and different forms and different burner designs as well to try and come up with something that heats efficiently, um, isn't too thirsty um, and also isn't horrendously noisy because uh, some of the gas furnaces I've had in the past, gas forges, um, have been like running blooming uh, jumbo jets in the workshop. Uh, this one, we actually built a... Um, uh, ribbon burner, so I was trying, trying that one out, um, seen quite a few designs for those in the States uh, and we built a foot long by I think it's three inch box on the top of this um, ribbon burner. Gets this forge which is actually a feral volume, it's a similar size to a mother um, and it gets it up uh, pretty bloody hot. Uh, not quite fire welding temp for like mild steel um, but it would certainly fire weld uh, higher carbon steels um, and this gets used all the time. Um, it's actually cold today because I haven't been doing much forging today. Um, but I probably use this more than I use a Coke forge, to be honest. Um, and I'm gonna, gonna make myself another ribbon burner forge, something much more small and compact that I can hopefully fire weld um, uh, normal mild steel in. So um, that's a project, uh, but it's not at the top of the list yet. But um, yeah, really enjoy making gas forges. There isn't a lot to them really, is there? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a blooming insulated box with a, with a flame that comes in the side. So, um, you know, Go and make yourself one. Um, if you're struggling for space or you haven't got room for flues and all the rest of it, uh, gas forge is definitely the way forward. Um, although I've really taken a shine into that induction forge that you guys have been playing with that Shona was showing us the other day uh, and Pete. Um, so I might have to invest in one of those because um, they look damn efficient. Um, so that's my gas forge um, in its current state. Um, so that's the sort of forge area. Um, now we're sort of moving into the fabrication side of my business um, and showing you some of the different bits and pieces that we've got in here. Um, so I've got three pillar drills in here, two sort of normal ones. Um, and then I've got my little radial arm drill, um, which uh, probably gets more use than the other drills actually. It's got a lot more torque than your standard pillar drill from um, Be It and Cue It. Um, and obviously you can clamp your piece of work down and then maneuver it into position. I would like the, the next size up from this, the ones with a hydraulic lift and lower or electric lift and lower because they're on gears usually, um, but space allowing, um, I might invest in one of those in the future. Um, but really handy, um, it's really good being able to obviously clamp down a, a you know, base plate or something and be able to drill four holes without having to unclamp it. Um, so, you know, absolutely love, uh, love the old radial arm drill. It's good, good bit of kit. Um, 
The fabrication side's a little bit more cramped. Uh, machines are a little bit closer together. Um, got the vertical bandsaw, um, which I've just taken the blade off because I drove it into something I shouldn't have done. Um, I'm much bigger fan of using uh, the vertical bandsaw than say cutting discs um, and having all that fiberglass and all that, those particles drifting around the workshop. Um, also gets used for wood and brass and bronze and all sorts of other stuff uh, that we do in the workshop here as well. Um, in the corner over there, I've got my lathe. I've got my little Colchester 2000 uh, hidden in the corner over here. Uh, picked this one up last year as well, I think. Um, we sort of refitted. The old one actually died last year, unfortunately. Um, the, the gearing went and it was more expensive to buy new gears than it was to buy this old thing. So um, this is a 1960s machine, I think. Um, and everything sort of works as it should um, and is accurate enough for what I do. Uh, we do end up making bearing parts and other bits and pieces. Also things like curtain poles, you know, we end up facing the bars off and drilling holes for the finials and stuff like that. Um, and it's much easier to, to do that on, on the lathe than it is to do it, you know, by hand with a pillar drill or a pistol drill or something similar. Um, the other thing I tend to do with the, with the lathe, um, which some of you will object to no doubt, is um, when I'm doing forged gates, uh, I tend to turn my tenons, especially on round bar, and you're doing a round tenon, I'll turn them on the lathe um, because I prefer that accuracy that comes with, with obviously machining that, that part that I can then push through my punched uh, hole and then rivet up. Um, yeah, I'm just used to it, it's quicker for me. Um, it's also something that I can give, give to um, one of the you know, uh, trainees to do and almost guarantee that they're gonna be the right length. Um, without having to tool up and do other bits and pieces. So um, yeah, that's the lathe. Um, good. So this is my little Ajax Miller machine. I've had a few different Miller machines over the years. Um, as I said, we do a bit of fabrication in here and a bit of machining as well. Um, and if I've got a lot of angle grinding to do, I'd rather set it up in the Miller machine and skim it off with a, with a surfacing end mill thingy, indexable end mill, um, than I would use a blooming nine inch grinder for eight hours a day. Um, I was using this last week for making the, the arms for a gate and for milling in the, the, the cup, I guess, for the back of the journal um, into some 40 square. That made a lot more sense and I didn't have the right size drill bit either, so I couldn't drill it out, which is my normal way of producing those. Um, so we milled it, you know, it made more sense. Um, also allows me to do things like make my own power armor dies out of like H13 and stuff. Um, and square everything up and make sure it's all the right rads and, and all the rest of it. Doesn't get as much use as I would like it to. Um, it's probably the, probably the most underutilized bit of kit in the workshop, but it didn't sting me for a lot of money. I think this thing cost me less than 1500 quid. Um, I've probably spent more on, on cutters than I have on the actual mill. So um, you can pick them up for an absolute song. Um, and it's probably not accurate enough for a machinist, but being a blacksmith, it's accurate enough for me. So um, yeah, it's a handy bit of kit to have around. So um, over towards the doors, I've got my horizontal bandsaw. Uh, this was a bit of a funny story getting this one because um, it was one of those eBay purchases which goes in the buyer's favour. Um, I was still a student. Uh, I think I'd had a bursary from the Worshipful Company um, to invest in tools and equipment uh, and I needed a bandsaw. So the seller had listed this uh, with some dodgy photos which didn't look very good uh, as an 8 inch cutting bandsaw. Um, and I went 8 inches. Yeah, that's a good size RSJ. That will do for, for me for a few years. Um, so I bought it, uh, got it delivered to the farm where, where my workshop is and got a phone call from me old man saying, what the bloody hell have you bought now? Um, how the hell are we going to move this bloody machine that's just turned up on a pallet? So I came home on a weekend from Hereford um, and discovered this absolute behemoth living on the driveway. Uh, and I think it took us about six hours to get it in the bloody workshop uphill off the driveway into the workshop doors. Um, and it's actually got an 18 inch capacity, not an eight inch capacity. So someone missed a digit there, um, but I can cut 18 inch ram bar on this if I so choose. Um, and other than a few carbides and other bits and pieces that this has needed throughout the years, um, it's done me very well um, and it's still going strong and will do for a long time to come. Um, I've never needed to cut 18 inch steel. It ain't gonna happen anytime soon. Um, and the biggest I've cut on this is 150 mil square bar. Uh, I haven't ordered anything bigger than that because I needed it. Uh, so over by the front door, I've got my little metal worker. Uh, this one is only a 40 ton uh, metal worker, might be 45 ton. 
Um, it's like the smallest of the range. Um, and I bought this when we were doing, still doing hardware because um, you don't want to be drilling hundreds of bloody five mil holes, 10 mil holes, um, when you can jig up and punch them out. Uh, it's really handy. I don't use it much for cutting bar because I don't like that flaw that you get in the end of the bar. Um, and when you forge it into a taper, I tend to find you get cracks and things on the end because you're obviously you're introducing micro fractures from this. Um, but it gets used more for punching holes um, and for, for doing some of those sort of fabrication-y type things. Um, you know, you're making base plates up. You don't want to be drilling holes all bloody day when this thing can do it in 10 minutes. Um, so I uh, found this to be actually a really good investment. Um, I'd love a bigger one, uh, but budget and money and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, it's, it's a handy thing to have in a workshop is a, is a metal worker, um, especially if you're gonna make weird and wonderful tooling. Um, I've got some bespoke bits of slots. That isn't one of them. Um, I couldn't find the one I was looking for. But um, you know, things like putting slots into, into steel and stuff, doing that the old fashioned way with the drill and cutting out the middle bit, it just is not sensible. Um, this is definitely the way to go on that. So last year, um, we, had, we had a good year in the workshop, all things aside. Um, and I managed to invest uh, in a CNC plasma cutter. Uh, this is an 8x4 machine from Extreme CNC. Um, and it's been a really good addition to the workshop. It only arrived um, six, eight weeks ago. It wasn't very long ago at all. So I haven't had as much time to play with it as I would like. Um, I've just taken on a, a new lad who is um, getting trained up on this one so that he can do more of that side of the fabrication side of things for me. Um, but I'm starting to use this more and more in my day-to-day -day work, um, in my forge work. So um, this morning, Liam has been cutting out for me uh, some vine leaves. So Liam's been, been cutting these out, quickly drew these up on SketchUp on the computer. SketchUp, if you haven't used it, is a really easy to use CAD package. Um, and I'm using that more and more for um, drawing bits and pieces for clients. Um, I wouldn't advise using SketchUp's rendering software, it's bloody awful, um, but there are some good um, additions. Enscape's one of them, um, and there's another one which are absolutely brilliant, um, can make your, your designs look real world. You know, you, you struggle to tell the difference between that and, and a photograph. Um, so SketchUp is one to, to learn, um, and is a damn sight cheaper than things like um, SolidWorks and stuff, where I think the guy wanted five grand when he did me a quote last year, he could get told where to whistle. Um, I'd rather buy a new toy than spend it on a CAD package. Anyway, so um, leaves. Um, we've always used leaves within our, in our designs, um, within our processes, um, and I've always had to shop it, either cut it out by hand using a vertical bandsaw or with a hand plasma cutter. Um, it's always been a little bit unsatisfactory, or I've had to shop stuff out to the laser cutters up the road um, and had delays and all the bits that go along with that. Um, when I did the oak tree um, gates last year, uh, we ended up, um, sending the design off to the laser cutters. Uh, it took them six weeks, I think, to finally get around to doing my job. Um, and I think some of that was, no, it was pre-COVID, that wasn't it. Um, and eventually when the stuff turned up, they'd actually cut them out the wrong size. Even though I'd specified the size, the damn things were 30% too big and I couldn't use them for that project. So then I had to wait another three weeks for the blooming replacements to turn up before I could actually start my job. Delays cost money, as you're all aware. Um, and you know, that sort of hindered what I was doing in the workshop. So that wasn't good. Um, so having this toy in the workshop um, is a big difference. You know, I need 30 of these things um, of this size and I need 30 slightly smaller. Um, and I can just quickly adjust my drawing, press print, boom, out they come. Um, I think these take less than 30 seconds to cut each, um, which is just wild. Um, and I'm, I'm still learning this, this gizmo. It's a new toy for me. Um, I'm training Liam, Liam up to, um, to be my CNC operator um, and he, he's going to come in part time and, and do that for me. So that, that's cool. Cut out all the bits and pieces I need on that. Um, so um, this is a project that um, I've not designed this one actually. Uh, architect has actually sent me a full scale drawing. That doesn't happen very often. Um, downside of paper drawing as I've said it on fire about 16 times already today um, or over the last few days. Um, but I'm going to take my plasma cut leaves, I'm going to then take them over to the forge, I'm going to chisel in um, veins and dish them and do all the other bits and pieces on the forge and then bring them back um, and sort of introduce them onto, onto this um, vine themed, wine themed, wine cellar door um, and I'm not looking forward to forging grapes, that'll be interesting. Um, but um, yeah, I'm trying to utilise that machine obviously and, and get it to pay for itself. Um, 
and using it to almost rapidly prototype different bits and pieces um, so I can use them in the workshop. Um, I've, as I said, I've always used sort of organic fo forms, um, leaves and different bits and pieces where, within my work. Um, and having to cut them out the old fashioned way, bands or them and stuff, it's always been a little bit unsatisfactory. And the speed that that thing cuts out on is just wild. Um, I couldn't believe it. When I plugged that in and pressed go for the first time, I, I was just gobsmacked at what it could do. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to utilizing that more and more within my work, um, doing more organic themed stuff. Um, and then also diversifying a little bit. So doing things like pub signs and stuff like that as well, um, which will sort of build into the fabrication side of business. Um, hopefully I can take my CNC guy on full time um, as, as the business grows, hopefully. Um, and we can make some more money and then spend it on YouTube making stupid things. So that's the plan anyway. Um, so moving outside, um, I'm quite fortunate. I got a bit of space next to my workshop uh, here on the farm um, and I can display some of my work outside. Um, this is a gate um, that is probably my, one of my favorite that I've designed. It's really simple and there's not a lot to it, um, but it just works. Um, and it's got organic theme to it and you know, it just flows. And I've made a couple of, of gates along this sort of theme over the years. Um, you'll have to ignore the rusty bolt in the middle there um, once replacing with a bit of stainless. Um, but you know, spring loaded latch, um, hangs off the back on the journal, taper on the bottom, all riveted together. Um, I was pretty pleased when I came up with that one. Um, and as I said, I've made a few of those over the years. Um, now in my display garden here, I've got a bit of a mix of sort of some of it's forged, some of it's fabricated. Um, we've got a fallen over tree. Go up there, you. Um, different gates and railings and different pieces. Also somewhere that I can show sculptural uh, bits as well. Um, I've got a few other bits and pieces. So um, let's show you around some of the work that we've got here in the yard. Now I've made quite a wide range over the years um, of different ironwork. Um, I'm mostly commission based, but you know, I have tried. Um, and as said before, we do quite a lot of shows, um, things like, you know, Bath and West, uh, RHS shows and stuff. Um, and you need stuff to take with you. Um, so everything in the yard here that you, you can see are sort of demonstration pieces really, or sample products um, that I've taken along to shows, uh, things like this garden arch. Uh, things like garden benches, the different gates and railings and different bits and pieces. Because, you know, customers are notorious for having absolutely no imagination whatsoever um, and really struggling to, you know, visualize what you're trying to explain. Um, it's probably a failure on my part and my lack of English. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of a few of the different bits and pieces that I've got here in the yard. Um, and some of my, you know, smaller sculpture objects. Um, so I've got my small, like, dandelion sculpture here. Um, which I quite like. Um, it was a little bit of fun, a little bit of an experiment. Um, I think I had a day spare and sort of uh, a big chunk of like 50 square. I was like, what can I do with a chunk of 50 square? Um, so I had a bit of a play in and came up with a little dandelion. And I quite like that one. Uh, so um, this is another sort of um, demonstration piece, I guess. Um, it's a, a radial sundial that I designed um, probably 10 years ago now. Um, and it's been the sort of centerpiece of quite a few um, sort of exhibition gardens and bits that I've done um, when I've been displaying my work around the country. Um, and I quite like it. It was quite a bit of fun. Um, it always, uh, it's always a fun one when you get the world of fabricators come up and they're looking for the MIG welds and they can't find them because it's all riveted, folks. So, um, yeah, it was nice. I, I liked it. It was um, reasonably contemporary, but of a sort of traditional theme. So um, I was quite happy with that, that concept and that design. Well, you'll recognize this gate. That's one I made as a student. Um, this is my sort of take on the sort of traditional bow top um, railings that you see all around the place. Uh, tried to mix it up a little bit, not do the same thing that everyone else was doing, but still was along that sort of classic theme. Um, this is my sample panel um, for that Ebba Vale job. I actually designed and made this one in my final year at um, uni, and uh, not uni, at Hereford. Um, and I, I quite like this one, you know, it was working off that sort of industrial theme um, and I was able to tie that in quite well with Ebba Vale and their sort of industrial heritage that they were trying to promote within the town centre. Um, and, you know, that really helped me to win that com uh, commission. Um, and I'm really proud of it. I really like the design and I liked how it all connected and went together um, and that utilisation of, of splitting and traditional techniques uh, without an over-reliance on MIG welding. Um, I do tend to do a lot of fabricated, um, fabri-forged work. Um, and I'm not embarrassed to say that I do, you know, yeah, I utilize a MIG welder. I live in 2021. Um, it's part of the world we live in. 
Um, I'm not a true traditionalist. If I think that something will work better um, with a result in a better aesthetic um, for the use of a MIG welder, I'm not embarrassed folks to say, I do use a MIG welder. There's nothing wrong with it. So I've, I've dabbled over the years and made a few different sculptural projects. Um, this is sort of a fabricated sculpture. It was just a bit of fun, really, something different to do. Um, this one I really liked. Um, I designed this one um, probably 12 years ago. Uh, Sam actually uh, forged this one up for me. Um, and, it, you know, it's fairly simple and straightforward, but, um, you know, I, I quite liked it. It was sort of a nautical theme that I was, I was trying to work off um, when I did that sort of little series. Um, and, you know, it's a piece of, of sort of heavy forging, um, heavily textured, um, and a simple zinc finish uh, with a sort of mordant wash, and I, I quite like it. Um, one of Sam's sculptures, um, he quite fancied doing a sperm sculpture, so that's what he did. Um, like it or lose it, that was, that was Sam, that was what he's interested in. Um, other little sculptures, so if I tend to get um, a free day um, in, the, in the calendar, um, something I like to do is experiment a little bit and try and come up with um, like a little sculptural piece that I can do in you know, a day or two days. Um, and like a little dragonfly like this one, which is part forged, part fabricated, is, is something um, that you know, I tend to do from time to time. And you know, I quite like it. Um, that one got us a commission, lady saw that and quite liked it. Um, and we ended up doing one sort of five, six times the size um, for her little manor house down the road. Um, and it was a nice fun project and um, the big one was all forged as well so that was, was quite cool. Um, I do want to do one with some glass in it so um, that would be a nice project to work towards. Uh, so here on the farm as well I've done a few commissions around the place. Um, my mum and dad live, live at the farm um, and I'm lucky enough to use the workshop on the farm um, but I don't live here. So my, my parents were after a design that went with the new build for the extension that was um, fairly organic sort of themed, not too traditional. Um, but definitely not too contemporary. You know, my parents are reasonably conservative um, and, um, you know, this design worked quite well. It fitted in with, with the sort of aesthetic, with, the, you know, my, my parents' passion for planting and for uh, growing. They, they used to run a plant nursery down here. Um, and, you know, it sort of fits within that theme. And around the corner is the, the big balcony, which was actually one of my first commissions. So, um, yeah, this is the commission. I'd say this was one of the first um, pieces that um, I made big, architectural ironwork um, that I worked on uh, after sort of graduating from Hereford. Uh, I was still getting set up in the workshop. We didn't have all the big toys then. We didn't have power hammers and we didn't have, you know, giant radial arm drills and all the big toys that I've got today. Um, so uh, this was actually all forged Smith and Stryker uh, by hand. Um, there are some fire welds on there, a lot of it's riveted. Um, I don't even think we had a MIG welder at the time. Um, so I think most of this was like arc welded frames uh, and all the rest of it. But it's all sort of hot punch, split bars, um, riveted, forged tenons and bits and pieces like that. Um, and sort of part fabricated as well um, with a zinc finish with the acid wash. Um, and that's been up there now for well over 10 years um, and still looks pretty good. Um, and I'm pretty pleased with it. My, my folks are pleased with it too. So uh, yeah, that's cool. Well, there you go, folks. Um, that's a bit about myself, a bit about my career. Um, sort of projects that we work on and a quick tour of my workshop as well. Um, I hope you guys have um, found this interesting and informative. Uh, I look forward to um, your questions uh, and I also look forward to having tours of your workshops and hearing about your careers and how you got into blacksmithing and where you're going and where you're planning on you know, working on and all the rest of it to go with it. Um, as part of this sort of talk series, um, we have launched the three bar challenge. Um, so the, the challenge is obviously to take a hundred mil of one square bar, one round bar and one flat bar uh, and use the theme uh, connected by fire, which is the theme for the 2021 AGM um, conference and uh, to you know, see what creative things you can come up with. So I look forward to seeing your uh, pieces for that uh, competition as well. Um, and you know, um, if you haven't done so already, you can follow us on, on Facebook and Instagram and check us out on YouTube if you're interested in seeing some of my daft video builds. Um, and until next time, um, it's been an absolute pleasure, guys, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Cheers.